see you. Hello, my name is Connor. I am from Dublin, which is just over there in uh, Europe. And it's fantastic. it's fantastic to be here. Absolutely wonderful. Uh, thank you all so much for making the effort for coming out. I know it's a late night show, but it's going to be a lot of fun. I promise and fucking hope. Anyway, um, <laughs> yes, like I say, I am from Dublin, uh, but I live in London. My mother hates the fact that I live in London. She says things like, London. <laughs> no one talk to a bus stop in London. <laughs> Good. Uh, to be fair though, her experience of London, completely different from mine. She was first in London in the 70s. You know, as a young Irish Catholic girl living in the big city, she found it difficult to get on, you know? And as an active member of the IRA, she found it hard to make friends. <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, it's been a weird year. It's been a weird year for me. Um, it's been a weird year. All right. I know laughing is the point, but for fuck's sake. Uh, it, it has been a weird year. Uh, this weekend last year, I, I lost my best friend. And uh, I don't want to bring the tone down. I know we're here for fun. I just miss him. I think though I'm lucky we ever met because he was great. And in a strange way, lucky we got to say goodbye because uh, we knew it was coming. But uh, yeah, it was a lovely wedding. And uh, he's, he's, uh, oh no, he's not dead. No, he's married. He's, he's dead to me. It's over. He's, uh, he's got a kid on the way. I am never talking to that prick again. Uh, I'm in my 30s now, which is a weird age because it sounds older than it actually is. Uh, I'll, I'll put it this way. When I was 18, if I was to hear someone dying in their 30s, I would have thought, <laughs> he had a good run, you know. <laughs> and it's just, it's, it, like weddings, for example, in my 20s used to be exciting. When I, like in my 20s, if somebody invited me to a wedding, I'd be like, oh my God, John and Susan are getting married. I can't wait to spend a weekend celebrating their special day. <laughs> it's not like that in your 30s. No, uh, it's more like a flu. Uh, uh, like, uh, honestly, because all of my friends are now dead and married, and it's, it's hard <laughs> because when I get an invitation now, I don't see it as, I just see it as judgmental because I'm not married. I just read it as John and Susan have their lives together. What the fuck are you doing with your life? <laughs> And also because there's been so many weddings over the past few years, I see a wedding invitation as a bill for 500 quid for a weekend away. I didn't really want to go on the first place. <laughs> So yeah, I live in London. My mother says things like, London's very dangerous. It's very dangerous. It's no more dangerous than any other big city. In fact, the most dangerous thing that's ever happened to me in London was my phone was stolen by a group of bastards on mopeds. Have you heard of this happening? This is a thing now. Like, you are not in trend if you are not being robbed by one of these fuckers. Like, there I was on, on London Bridge, just walking down the road, looking at a map. Next thing you know, beside me on the footpath. And I thought, well, that's... Strange place to be driving a moped. <laughs> <laughs> just kept walking next thing. Oh, another one behind me. I thought, well, they must be having a race. This is fantastic. Then I just, I just started Googling mopeds, thinking I'd look fucking great on one of those. And so, <laughs> boom, phone was gone. Now I gave chase, but because I was carrying a backpack and a bad hangover, I got about 10 feet and I thought, fuck it, they want it more. Uh, I found a policeman who immediately victim blamed me. He said, well, sir, you were using the phone outdoors. <laughs> No help whatsoever. I got the phone replaced and a few days later, my dad, he rang me on the new phone. He did what he always does. He just blamed society. He said, back in my day, son, people didn't go around robbing phones. Yeah, that, because back in your day to rob a phone, you'd have to break into the house you bought in a single income with no degree and tear it off the kitchen wall you're looking for. My parents are homo. Anyone, anyone a homeowner in the room? Uh, well, well done, good for you. Uh, my parents are homeowners and uh, so are most of their friends. And my parents have themselves convinced that the reason they bought a house for 10 grand in the 80s, which is now worth hundreds of thousands, is because they're savvy investors. <laughs> that's the only reason that's happened. Like, and I asked my dad for some advice. He's like, Dad, how did you do it? How did you get in the ladder? He goes, well, back in our day, what you did was uh, you, you, you bought a home. That was all you had for me. There was no, there was nothing else. Like, my, my parents' house was about 10 grand. It's now worth hundreds of thousands. And like, my dad says things like, well, your generation, the problem is you don't know how to save. That's what the issue is. <laughs> Back in our day, you had to save half the value of the home if you wanted a mortgage. But you had to save five grand. That must be fucking tough, Dad. That must be very <laughs> So it has been a weird year for me. Comedy's been going all right. I've got to uh, travel around the world a bit. I got to go to South Africa uh, last year, which is amazing. Has everyone ever been there? It's, it's stunning. One of the be most beautiful places I have ever been in my life. I started off in Cape Town, which is literally God's country. I've never seen somewhere more beautiful. Then I went to Johannesburg. And, uh, <laughs> Johannesburg was fine, uh, but it, I was warned about it. People were like, be, be careful in Johannesburg, it's a bit dangerous, it's a bit dodgy, you've got to be careful. It's a nice place, but be careful. And I was like, it's fine, it's not that bad. I thought people were exaggerating a bit. Until I got a message from my Airbnb host. It just simply said this, it said, 
I'll be here when you arrive, uh, and I'll have a blah blah blah, keys, blah blah, blah. follow the signs, the M4 Johannesburg, follow blah blah blah. That's all fine, yeah. Not, not an issue at all. Until the rest of the message came through, which was this. Make sure no one is following you. If so, try and lose them. <laughs> Emergency number is 112. Don't worry though, you'll be fine. Uh, absolutely shitting myself in my fucking rental car. Everyone I thought on the road behind me was following me. I was driving like a fucking maniac. Luckily, luckily nothing bad happened. I was absolutely grand. But what, what I did end up doing was a few amazing gigs in Joburg and I got to go on a mini safari, which was literally the most amazing thing I've ever got to do in my life. I was there in the, in the safari park, you know, I watched like real zebras crossing. I got to see like, I got to see, I got to see lions in their almost natural environment and it made me jealous of anyone who's ever done this before. It got me thinking of Ireland and I thought, in Ireland, we have nothing like this. The closest we have in Ireland is Dublin Zoo. And Dublin Zoo is owned by the government, which technically makes all the animals fucking civil servants. <laughs> so if you get there after 11 o'clock any day of the week, you are not seeing shit. That's what's happening. <laughs> like calling in, Mr. Lion, I've got kids here. Don't the fuck off, I'm on my break. Like, that's, uh... <laughs> so no, this has been a, a good, th this show is about this very simple thing that happened to me a while ago. Uh, my mother texted me. She said she'd found something in my old bedroom. And I thought, oh fuck, I thought I got rid of all of it. Um, what she found in my old bedroom was a letter sent to me almost 20 years ago by registered post, and it was unopened. And she desperately wanted to know what was inside. She was like, what's in the envelope? I want to know. Is it some sort of time capsule? I was like, technically, mum, it is, but please don't open it. Because what it was, folks, is my band's demo when, when we were 14 years of age. And oh my God were we the greatest pile of shite you've ever heard. <laughs> but we didn't think we were. That was the beauty of being that age. We made this demo. I was in charge of singing, writing the songs, and playing guitar. I had no talent at any of those things. <laughs> I didn't let it stop. I had lyrics like, you don't like me, because I'm real, and you're jealous. <laughs> that was one of my first lyrics I wrote. 15 year old Connor wrote that, and I sang it like in an American accent, like, you don't like me cause I'm real, and you are jealous. <laughs> the only thing real about me at that age was my shitty haircut and my masturbation habits. Like that was that. I thought I was cool. I, I was so far from me. I had really long hair. Like I grew up down past my shoulders with an undercut. It stank as well, cause I, cause I never washed it very much. If I turned my head too quickly, I'd have to take a sit down. Like that's a, cause I'd have a whack, like fuck. Oh. I used to get called umbop in school as well. People just shouted at me, umbop! Umbop, get your fucking hair cut, umbop! Umbop being a reference to that band Hanson. Remember those three hot chicks from the 90s? <laughs> Like on the way to school, I get abuse. Like people driving by in cars, like, eh, 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 get your fucking hair cut, you look like a girl. And I'd be like, Dad, leave me alone. You know, I just. <laughs> I, I really, I, I didn't care though. I thought I was, you know, I thought it was cool, so it didn't matter to me. I remember I, I took up smoking because it looked amazing. And uh, I was late for class one day. I remember this incident. I used to get, like, I wouldn't say I got bullied in school because that would imply that I hadn't done anything wrong. Uh, or that I didn't deserve everything I fucking got. Uh, but I remember I was late for school or class one day and the bell rang and I decided to take a shortcut through the older boys corridor. Big mistake. Now, when you're, when you're about 14, 15, an 18 year old boy looks like they got a pension and a home and a family. Like, uh, do you know what I mean? They look fucking old men, you know? And I remember I decided to cut through their corridor and halfway through I realized I'd made a big mistake because one of the doors was wide open and what was sounding like a riot was taking place inside. There was a teacher absent and these guys were left unattended. Now, I'd seen in a movie once that predators don't notice you if you walk slowly. <laughs> now, the movie was Jurassic Park, but anyway. So I decided to get by the door like this. And I make it. I get by the door. I'm fine. I'm about five feet away from the door. I just hear, oh, my! <laughs> um bop, get back here, um bop. I start running, but because I'm in a band, I couldn't run very fast. Uh, so I started like sort of jogging away like this. I was being chased by a couple of rugby players. One guy called Dave O'Shaughnessy, who ended up playing rugby for Ireland for a few years. He ran after me first. He shoulder tackled me right into the lockers. I banged my head and I fell on the ground. He jumped on top of me and just started choking me. All these other guys running around going, yeah, you fucking girl, get your hair cut, get your hair cut. Something about my hair maybe made him 
question his own sexuality or something. <laughs> and he was possibly trying to, you know, squeeze the gayness out of himself by choking me on the ground. But that's, I'm on the ground just going, oh, and as he's doing, he's like, get your fucking haircut, Umbop. You look like a girl, Umbop. Get your fucking haircut. Right? And as this was happening, I had an out of body experience. I, I, I floated above my soon to be corpse. And I looked down at what was happening. And in that moment, I felt like Jesus Christ because I already had long hair, <laughs> but also because I forgave them. <laughs> I knew the only reason they were doing this is because I was real and they were just jealous. <laughs> I, uh, I was trying to figure out for the show why I ever wanted to be in a band. Uh, and I, I trace it all the way back to being in play school. I was in play school like a lot of kids and uh, I wasn't very good at it. Uh, I was held back in play school. <laughs> you have to be a particular level of moron. Uh, I was quite a sensitive, quiet kid, and I was held back in play school. And I think it did me a bit of damage because I've always felt like a square peg in a round hole, and I've chased it, or traced it back to then. Oh. Because I remember, yeah, no, thanks very much. Um, <laughs> I remember I was held back, and the reason I was is because I was a quiet kid, and I wasn't very good at talking to people or making friends, believe it or not. And I, all the other kids were moved on to the next year, and I was stuck there doing the same lessons I'd done before, you know, growing cress, shit like that. Uh, and I remember the next year when I was, I was asked, you know, I was held back and I'm watching my little friends that I'd made the year before across the yard waving at me thinking there's something fucking wrong with me and no one's, <laughs> and no one's explaining to me what the problem is. So I think that's what, and so that, then I started taking place go seriously. I decided to knuckle down. I decided to start dressing to impress. I, I started wearing power cardigans and dicky bows. That's, uh, <laughs> uh, that's the way it's going. Yeah. There's me pushing away the ABCs like this. Like I fucking got this. <laughs> Bring on the tadpoles! Uh, yeah, that was me, yeah. Cute, cute kid, moving on. <laughs> I was, I was in a band, and uh, it's because of that. Uh, but yeah, so anyway, so, by the way, this is the first time I've done the show since Edinburgh, so forgive me if I'm just like, I don't know what I'm talking about anymore. <laughs> but no, I do. Uh, so basically, I wanted to know why I was in a band, and. I figured it out, well, basically, because it's, it's then. And I was a pretty quiet, well-behaved kid. I never got in that much trouble um, at all, really. Uh, the worst thing I ever did uh, was, well, I was a pyromaniac for a brief <laughs> period of time. Was anyone here ever a pyromaniac? Yeah, a few people, yeah. If you don't know what that is, it's basically you like burning. And um, <laughs> I had one friend, he lived down the road. His name was Dave. Me and Dave were best friends. And we were best friends because he lived down the road. That was the only reason. <laughs> I call him a legacy friend because we're still friends now solely because I've known him that long. But if I met him as an adult, I'd be like, what the fuck is wrong with that fella? <laughs> but he was a great guy to be friends with at that, that age. He was a great guy to be into fire with because his dad was the most irresponsible man I have ever met in my life. He used to leave bullets on the kitchen table, no joke, full on shotgun shells, which were used as a starting gun for races. And he just leave them there where little hands could get them. And one day I called into Dave's house and he says, Today, Connor, what we're going to do is we're going to take some of these bullets, we're going to empty the gunpowder into an envelope, we're going to make a line and start a fire with them. And I thought, there's nothing wrong with that sentence whatsoever. <laughs> so we go down to the beach, we have three or four bullets worth of gunpowder in this envelope, we bring it down to the beach, we find a wall to lean against, we make a line of gunpowder and a pile of gunpowder. Now, in the cartoons, which is where we were getting our information, <laughs> Gunpowder goes tss, tss, bang. In reality, gunpowder goes bang, and it's like it's, I found that out the hard way because, well, Dave's job was very simple. His job was to light the gunpowder with matches. My job was equally simple, uh, but just as important. My job was to block the wind. And, uh, so I'm leaning over this gunpowder and Dave's looking at me going, we're running out of matches, it's getting windy. I'm like, I know, I know. I pull up my little plastic anorak and hold it over my head and lean down for it. He goes, get on your knees, it's not working. So I get right down on my knees, last match, boom, sets me on fire. I'm fall on the ground, roll around for a while. The fire goes out. Eventually Dave comes up to me and he goes, don't tell anyone this happened. So I didn't. But he's a mate, so you know, what can you do? Uh, it's fine. But that's the worst, I remember I, I cycled home, I didn't tell anyone, I was planning not to, but by the time I got home, 
I looked like Freddy fucking Krueger. So I had to tell someone. My dad was like, what happened to your head? And I was there, I, I, I and then just started lying like children do. I said, I fell in a bonfire. And he went, it's been raining for three days. I know you're lying. And I went, uh, huh, well, okay. And he goes, just tell me what it was. I need to know. And I go, fine. It was just a bit of gunpowder. Calm down. Uh, I got in a huge amount of trouble, so did Dave. Then I, uh, a few weeks later, Dave did the same thing with another guy. And uh, that other guy got badly burnt. Um, yeah, pretty sad. Uh, but I met that other guy at a party in London a few months ago. And we got chatting about Dave in the old days. I tell the story I just told you about the gunpowder. And Dave goes white during the story. And I go, but you heard the story before. He goes, yes, I know. But I didn't realize he'd also told you to block the wind as well. <laughs> When I'm at weddings with Dave now, I just make sure he's nowhere near candles. It's fine, other than that. But no, that was the worst trouble I ever got into. Like I said, I was a relatively angelic kid. Uh, and there I was, there, just me at about, about 12 or 13. I'm holding uh, Smashing Pumpkins, Melancholy and the Infinite Sadness. That's one of my favorite albums of all time. This photo was taken a few days before my life was changed forever. <laughs> because I had started in a new school, and I started, well, a new year in school, and I'd made some new friends. I made friends with a guy called Will. He was in a band. He had long hair. He called down to my house one day. The doorbell rang. My dad answered and called up to me going, Connor, there's a girl at the door for you. And I run down, <laughs> excited, and it's just fucking Will. Uh, and he goes, uh, do you want to come over to the shed for a jam? And I just go, I've already eaten. And he goes, uh, he goes no, come to the shed for a jam. So I go to the shed, right? And there is Will, and there's Peter, and this other guy, Dave, a different Dave. They're all sitting there. Peter's behind a drum kit, Dave's got a bass guitar. The place is full of smoke. They've been chain smoking for hours. And I'm just thinking, do they have any idea how bad smoking is for their health? <laughs> That's the kind of guy, I was gonna give him a lecture on the dangers of cigarettes, but I realized probably not the coolest thing to do. Uh, next thing you know, they started jamming. They started playing a song called Breed by Nirvana. And uh, it was just note for note, amazing. And the hair stood up at the back of my neck and I had a bit of an epiphany. I thought, right, that's it. That's what I'm doing with the rest of my life. I am joining a band. I'm going to become a rock star. Everyone will love me and respect me then. That will be great. So by the time the song was over, the music stopped. I looked at them and said, give me a fucking cigarette. I am in. <laughs> and they had no idea what I was talking about, but it didn't matter. <laughs> So this I call, this is my larvae stage. Uh, this is before puberty really kicked me in the bollocks. Um, that came a year later. Notice that it's the same <laughs> shirt. <laughs> Look at the needless anger on my face. <laughs> that is, by the way, the same shirt. Look, brand new, by a fresh, lovely, angelic boy. Oh, what the fuck, I don't even know. <laughs> I just remember being angry all the time for no fucking reason. <laughs> Getting into needless fights with my parents. My, my mother like, asking me a reasonable thing, like, do you mind flushing the toilet after using it? And I'd fly off into a rage, like, you don't even know me, and run to my room. <laughs> I'd cry. <laughs> Incidentally, uh, this photo was taken about 10 minutes I'd ha after I'd had a wank, and I know that. <laughs> oh. I know that because every photo at that age was 10 minutes after I had a wank. <laughs> I don't think I would have survived the internet age. I, like, I nearly pulled the plum off myself watching fucking Richard and Judy. Like, I couldn't... I couldn't have survived the internet. No, like, I mean, I, I think porn is just gone out of hand. Like, when I was... When I, when I was that age... When I was that age in Ireland, porn was practically illegal. The best you could hope for was maybe half a boob in a cosmetic surgery ad in Good Housekeeping magazine. Or, like, a breast check on TV. Like, something like that, but... <laughs> But now porn is everywhere and I think it's damaging society. It's giving young people an unrealistic image of sex. It's giving young men a disrespectful, unfair, unattainable image of women. But ladies, can we be honest just for a moment and admit that porn's given women a pretty fucking unrealistic image of men. <laughs> <laughs> and not just the size, no, because if you've ever seen a man reach climax in porn, he pretty much screams and shouts and moans the house down. And that's fucking ridiculous. <laughs> ladies, you think you got the monopoly on faking orgasms? <laughs> oh no you don't because if your man has ever made any more noise than the sound of a backward sneeze he's the one faking orgasms seriously anything more than <clears throat> like that's the sound we make at the height of pleasure it's not a very pleasant sound but that's all it is I know it's a <laughs> <laughs> I, look, I, I'm a gentleman, so when, when I'm on the job, I make noise. I'd be like, yeah, yeah, baby. Uh, sorry, not at you. I'd be like, yeah. I'd be like, 
I'm like, yeah, baby, it's really good. But 10 seconds before the end, I have to concentrate. So I'm just like, yeah, baby, it's really good, yeah. <laughs> like, that's really <what> <laughs> There's a perfectly rational explanation for that, folks. The reason we do that, the reason that happens is because when we discovered ourselves at that age, we did that shit in absolute silence. Because that's the way your friends, your family, your neighbors want us. Think about, think about how damaging and disturbing it would be to be that age again, if you had to make as much noise they do in the movies. Like calling over to your best friend's house before you open the garden gate, you just hear him in his bedroom just go, fucking yeah! <laughs> Ringing the doorbell, his mother answering it, who's not slept in six fucking months. <laughs> just disheveled and shaking, going, yeah, he's in his bedroom interfering with himself. Who's from there now, right? <laughs> so this is my, uh, this is what I call the caterpillar stage. I'm not quite fully developed into the biggest tool you've ever seen in your life. That, uh, that took another year. Um, <laughs> Year after this photo was taken. Hello, ladies. Uh, oh yeah, there you go. What? <laughs> yeah, that's me. A um, few things you got to notice about this <laughs> picture. Uh, first of all, uh, there's Will there. He's got the same haircut as I do, uh, and uh, there's me. I'm wearing a t-shirt with a knife on it. I bought that t-shirt with my own money as well. I, I went into town and spent hours, hours shopping around and found this t-shirt. And I thought nothing says Connor more than a fucking knife on the t-shirt. I mean, you, you've heard the phrase, don't take a gun or a knife to a gunfight. Don't take Connor to fights because he can't fight. But no, the knife is giving you... Also, by the way, there are no frame, or there's no glass in those frames. That is just me being a complete bell end. <laughs> I am, um, yeah, I still, I'm happy it happened, but listen. <laughs> so, this, oh sorry, keep pointing at that, I shouldn't. Anyway, um, the reason, this is the uh, letter, of this, this is the demo it came in, this is the actual one. Uh, the reason I sent it to myself, by the way, is this was an old school way of uh, copywriting your music. That's what you had to do. If you wanted to copyright music, you'd post it to yourself by registered post. And the reason, the reason me and the lads had decided to do this is because we were dropping the demo into uh, the letterbox of Larry Mullen Jr., the drummer from U2. And I thought, we need to fucking protect ourselves here, lads. Because <laughs> the second U2 hear these riffs, they'll have no choice but to drop them from us. <laughs> so I dropped the demo into, uh, into uh, Larry Mullen, uh, as you do. And uh, in the le I just sent a little letter saying, dear Larry, how are you? Uh, here's our band's demo. Uh, love if you could give us a bit of feedback. Also, we were disappointed not to get tickets to see you guys in Slane. Hope you enjoy the show. Thought nothing of it. Well, thought a lot of it, but fuck it. Went home. <laughs> Following day, my phone rang. It was Larry Mullen. Rang me up himself. He just went, hello, is that Connor? And I said, yes. He said, this is Larry Mullen. I went, oh my God, hi Larry, Jesus, thank you for calling me. Did you get the demo? He goes, I haven't heard it yet. And I go, oh, fair enough, don't worry. <laughs> and he goes, do you still want to go to Slane? And I went, yeah, I'd love to go to Slane. And he goes, right, well, look, there's two tickets waiting for you in the U2 office if you want to go in and pick them up. And I was like, Larry, that's unbelievable. Thank you, it's so generous. And he was like, no, no, you have to pay for them. And I thought, what a fucking cunt. <laughs> <laughs> So I went into town and I picked up, I picked up the demo. Or sorry, the tickets. And they cost me 80 pounds, which back in those days was almost 80 pounds. And, uh, and I realized there's a problem. What he'd done is he'd give me tickets for the extra date they just added that day. And I wasn't even gonna be in the country. So I decided to do what any noble fan would do, which is immediately put them in the buy and sell and try and sell them to an American for 500 quid. <laughs> It worked. Uh, a few days later, I got a phone call. I go, hey, is this Connor? I went, yes, it is. He goes, you still got the U2 tickets? I go, I do indeed. He goes, can I have them? And I went, well, for money. And he went, OK, can we meet somewhere public? I went, you're not coming to my house, so yeah. <laughs> so we go and we meet in a place called the Marine Hotel in Sutton. Now, this story sounds bizarre and unbelievable. And fair enough if you don't believe me, but this actually happened. We go into the Marine Hotel. It's 3 o'clock on a Friday afternoon. I have just gotten myself a new fake ID. Which, is, which, which made me a god amongst my friends for a few days. I order myself and will a pint. We sit down waiting for this guy to come in and take the tickets. We sit down enjoying our drinks. And as we're sitting down, the barman comes over to our table and says, lads, are you supposed to be here? And we're dressed like, well, 
like these guys. This is us here. Uh, we're just looking like that in the middle of this posh enough bar, <laughs> having a beer. And the barman's like, are you supposed to be here, lads? Now, if you're ever asked that question, just say yeah. Well, what's the worst that's going to happen? They'll kick you out. That's what we thought. We sat there and we said, yeah. He goes, fair enough, so. He sits down, right? And next thing you know, or sorry, he goes back to the bar. This American guy walks in. He spots us. He comes to us. He goes, have you got the tickets? And I say, yes. He goes, I have the money. And I go, OK. He fans the money. Now, obviously, this man had never done any haggling in his entire life because <laughs> he fanned out 500 quid in front of me and he went, can we discuss the price? And I went, absolutely not. Took the money off. <laughs> gave the tickets and he fucked off. So we're sitting there enjoying our pints. I'm holding 500 pounds in cash in my hand. I've never had more money in my life ever myself. And we were thinking, we're almost millionaires. We can do whatever we want from now on. Uh, life is going to be fun. And as this is happening, we're having this chat. The bar gets emptied out. The barman's literally kicking people out. He starts locking the doors. Curtains are being pulled down. Side doors are locked. And then the back doors are opened. And next thing you know, Larry Mullen himself walks into the bar. <laughs> then the edge. Then the other one. <laughs> <laughs> and then Bono. <laughs> And they're all very well dressed. They're followed by almost every famous person I've ever heard of in Ireland. They're all dressed in like full on suits and everything. And I'm thinking, oh fuck. Uh, they found out about our buy and sell scam. <laughs> we're, we're, we're in serious trouble. We're looking at jail time for this. this is, uh... And then we find out what had actually happened. Is we had accidentally stumbled across the after party for Bono's dad's funeral. So we're sitting there in the middle of the afters for Bono's dad's fucking funeral, dressed like this. <laughs> and we're thinking to ourselves, right, well, listen, if we run away, it's going to look bad. Let's just sit down and sip our drinks and leave. And besides, it's the first pints I ever bought on my own as well, so I wasn't wasting it. Next thing, Bono starts making the rounds of all the seats and everyone that was there just to say thanks for coming. And he's coming towards us, and we was like, he's fucking coming over here. And I was like, he is coming over here. <laughs> Okay, he gets over to our table and he just looks at us for a few moments thinking, I don't know what he was thinking. He just looked at us in a very kind of like perplexed sort of like, he just went, how are we lads? And we said, the only thing you can say in that situation, which is, Bono. And uh, <laughs> he said, um, thanks for coming. Thanks for coming, it means a lot. And we went, he was a great man. <laughs> And then as he walked away, Will turned around and said, have you heard the demo? I was like, not now, not now, fuck! It's not the right time. So anyway, I was gonna show you, now we're gonna say, what I did myself, well, what I did for myself was a big favor when I was that age, when I sent the demo to myself. Because I had written down all of the lyrics to all of the songs, and I posted them to myself as well, just in case somebody tried to steal the fuckers off me. Now I'm not gonna read all of them, I'm just gonna read one or two. Um, well, okay, first of all, this is a, from a song called Prison. <laughs> <laughs> you put the foot down long ago about where I can be and where I can go. <laughs> that one was about my parents. <laughs> <laughs> now, this is the song. We had one song, I thought. One song that I thought was going to put us over the edge and, and like be the breakout hit that we needed. Uh, and I was very proud of it at the time. Uh, and I'll read you the lyrics in, well, not all of them, but most of them. Uh, it's a song called Just 17. And uh, I wrote it about uh, my friend's older sister, who just happened to be just 17. <laughs> she was just 17 alone and reading teenage mags. Now, I figured out as an adult that 17 year olds don't read teenage mags. 12 year olds do. Anyway, uh, <laughs> she was just 17 alone and reading teenage mags. Then one day she grew up and now she only brags about how life has changed for her and what she has become. Now, I know what you're thinking. It's pretty fucking decent. Uh, <laughs> here comes the chorus. So, how can you say you'll only meet older guys? Are they better? <laughs> How can you say you won't meet me? It's my time you're wasting. <laughs> she was just 17, but she acted like a 20-year-old. 
Because when you're 15, a 17 year old, like 17 is old and 20 is fucking dead. Uh, <laughs> and then it's like, a, then one day when I met her, I couldn't get in the club, was carted at the door because I was four years too young. Matt's not being my strong point at that point. Uh, anyway, uh, I thought we were, I thought, the, okay, anyway, they're sharp enough lyrics, but fuck you guys. Um, uh, incidentally, was anyone here ever in a band? No, one, no, anyone, you? Cool. Now, I think you might agree with me on this. The hardest part of being in a band isn't the songs, it isn't the practice, it isn't the learning how to play. It's coming up with a name for the band. It's one of the hardest things you can ever do. We spent months, years, trying to come up with a good name. We went through several, we changed every other day until we landed on one that worked. We started off with this one, Chinchilla. Oh, it won't work, there we go. <laughs> chinchilla, that was, uh, yeah, it's a bit shit, isn't it? Uh, several problems with it. No, first of all, none of us were sure what a chinchilla was. Uh, I thought it was some sort of vampire. Uh, uh, secondly, none of us could fucking spell chinchilla, so that was out. Um, that's not a, no, it's a, sh it's a shit name. Um, but the next name was a bit shitter. Uh, we, we, it's almost as if we'd admitted defeat before even starting. Uh, we went with this. Nobody's perfect. Uh, uh, please welcome to the stage. Nobody's perfect. Uh, they're not great. They're not very good. Uh, nobody's perfect, aren't great. Pretty, um, pretty shit name. Uh, not as shit as the next name we had, which was the shittest of all time. Uh, sediment. We didn't know it actually meant shit. Uh, we called ourselves Sediment. Like, please welcome to the stage. Sediment. It's like, that's pretty fucking shit. We're like, yeah, no, it's shit. <laughs> sediment was fine. Sediment was fine. Um, and then we changed to something else briefly. Uh, we went with this uh, cure, but we realized after a while there was a similar name of a, uh, of a band that was slightly more successful than us. So we decided to change it up a bit. We wanted to go with something edgy. We wanted to go with something that people would really, would really speak to people, would really make people go, oh yeah, we need to pay attention to these guys. So we called ourselves for about three days, Danger Time. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing dangerous, nothing dangerous about it. The most dangerous thing about me was the picture of a knife on my t-shirt. Uh, you heard the lyrics, no, uh, we're not a dangerous band at all. So after Danger Time, people got slagged us up enough for, for that, or slagged us off enough for that, we decided to go with this name. And this is the name we stuck with till the band disappeared forever. The name we went with was this. If. No. If. Please welcome to the stage, if. Fucking yeah, and by the way, the ellipsis there is a stylistic choice. Uh, now there's a few reasons we went with if. Perfectly rational, reasonable uh, reasons. First of all, everyone can spell it. Uh, secondly, you can just put it on walls and buses and graffiti it fucking everywhere. So if was the name we went with. We were delighted. This is us at our first gig. There's us jamming. There's me. I, at this stage, by the way, I had my hair cut because Metallica had had their hair cuts. Uh, so therefore, we had to have our hair cut. That's how it worked. There's me playing guitar, too embarrassed to look towards the camera, going bright red. There's Peter on the drums. There's Tom communicating with aliens through his chest. Uh, <laughs> at some point. There's another one of us there. Uh, I'll say, there that's uh, Tom again. Now the, the message is getting stronger. <laughs> Me, literally bright red, bright red. So scared of being on stage. There's Will, he's just giving up. He, he doesn't even give a shit at this stage. I'm looking at the hands by the side going, this is fucking shit, we are shit. <laughs> if are shit. And you know what, it doesn't matter anyway because no one is paying any attention whatsoever. <laughs> so we decided, uh, <laughs> we decided to get rid of Tom. Uh, I don't know, he disappeared, and then we went with this new guy. Hang on, uh, uh, is there somebody standing in front of my thing? No? Oh God, professionalism, ladies and gents. There you go! This is, this, uh, this is about a year later. I, I've grown a bit. Uh, there's Neil, our new bassist, who's taller. That's the only reason he's in the band. Uh, there's Peter on the drums. There's me playing away. And there's Will on guitar. Will is still, to this day, my best friend, by the way. Uh, yeah, no, he is, yeah, yeah. Uh, so much so that uh, recently he asked me to be his best man. Thank you. Which is an honor. Yeah. Thanks. It's an honor and a honor and a privilege being a best man. Okay. Um, uh, <laughs> let's take this uh, opportunity to take a seat. You okay? 
He asked me to be the best man, which was brilliant. It was the, it was, it was honestly an honour and a privilege. Uh, unlike being a bridesmaid, apparently that's a giant pain in the hole. Uh, no, being a best man, I was delighted with being a best man. Absolutely loved it. And for me, nothing highlights the reason why men and women can't be best friends platonically uh, than, than how we build up into a wedding. And the reason I say that, ladies, is because in my experience, women love their best friends. Uh, they care about them. Uh, they pick them up when they're feeling down. It's not been my experience of best friends. <laughs> no, in my experience, a best friend is only there to cause as much physical, financial, and emotional damage as possible. Why? It's funny. <laughs> I'll put it another way. My sister got married last year. For her hen party, her friends took her to the west of Ireland. They went to a spa. They drank champagne. They talked about their feelings. It was magical. <laughs> my best friend got married last year. We took him to Prague. And I paid to have that fucker arrested. <laughs> it's the single greatest thing I have ever done. There we were in Prague. Now, we started the day doing what the locals do, which of course is drinking at a gun range. Let me tell you, the Americans are onto something with this, because guns and booze, phenomenal uh, combination. <laughs> After the gun range, we jump on our minibus, we're heading towards a strip boat, but there is no strip boat. That was just a ruse I'd invented, because that's when the fake arrest was going to take place. Uh, the stag was quite excited about the strip boat, though. He's like, oh, strip boat, what are that's going to be like? I was like, probably tits in a boat, get in the bus. So. Um, <laughs> We're driving down the motorway, we're singing songs, we're drinking beers, we're having the time of our lives, and all of a sudden, woo, police car pulls over the minibus, and these two gigantic, military-clad policemen get on the bus, and they just start screaming at the driver, and the driver starts shouting back at them, and at that point, the stag looks at me and goes, hoo -hoo, driver's in trouble. <laughs> I just thought, you're in trouble. Because <laughs> next thing you know, one of the cops turns to us. Now, forgive me for this, this is my Eastern European accent, which means it covers Germany, to the border of China. And uh, <laughs> he just goes, we have been on high alert for the past six months. We've received information you're training with weapons in our country. We need to see everyone's IDs immediately. Now, even though I knew that was fake, just for that moment I thought, oh fuck. <laughs> so we hand our IDs to the guy. He takes them, he disappears, he comes back a minute later, he gives everyone back their IDs, except for one guy, except for the stag, Will. He just goes, who is William? And Will's like this. <laughs> and he goes, William, you are wanted in several countries. Will's there, <laughs> no. I've never been arrested before in my life. And the cop just goes, we can do this the easy way or the hard way. <laughs> Will's there again, officer, you got the wrong guy. But before you know it, the other cop just grabs Will by the neck, mashes his head into the seat, puts a knee in his back, puts handcuffs on him, drags him off the bus, pushes him in the back of a police car. It was fucking amazing. <laughs> Then he goes, one, you can keep an eye on him. And I go, I'll go, I'll keep an eye on the best friend, the best man. So I jump in the front of the police car, wheels in the back with a cop beside him. Wheel is scared at this point. I know that, because he's sweating a lot. But because of the handcuffs, he can't do much about it. So he's just rubbing his head on the window. <laughs> he literally looks like he's supposed to be in the back of a police car at this point. <laughs> So we hit the motorway at top speed, where it's you know weaving in and out of traffic, sirens blaring, and at this point I decide to spice things up a bit more. So I turn around to Will and I go, seriously, what the fuck did you do? <laughs> and he looks at me like this, I don't go. <laughs> With this real kind of confused look, like have you ever had an STD test? And you convince yourself that you've got AIDS, even if you haven't had sex that whole year. You know that feeling? <laughs> like, I, like I brushed off the toilet and the weather spoons. Uh, <laughs> just don't have anything, like... Uh, with that level of confusion, he was like, there was a fight in a bar in Germany during the World Cup, but I was 11. I don't know. I'm, uh, I was like, we're in fucking trouble. He goes, I know. We keep going a bit further. Eventually, from the back of the car, Will perks up. He says, officers, we've been driving for a long time. Where are we going? And the cop driving the car without skipping a beat just goes, we are secret police. We bring you to a secret location. <laughs> from now on, you wear masks. Next thing you know, the cop next to Will takes out two pairs of blacked out ski goggles and Will starts having a fucking panic attack. He's like, no, Jesus, no, God, no, God. And the cop going, oh no, God, no, Will's oh, God, no, God, no. Ring John, ring John. I take out my phone and ring John. John's a lawyer, he's on the trip with us and he's in on the whole thing. I'm like, John, they're making us wear masks. He just goes, brilliant. <laughs> like, I got a tap on the shoulder, it's the cop behind me, I turn, he's like this. Because there's Will blindfolded, doing a pretty decent Stevie Wonder impression at that point. Just, <laughs> That's harsh. Stevie Wonder, he's not blind or anything like that. <laughs> so we hit a roundabout. We go back the way we came. We go back to the gun range where we started the day, right? But we go in the back entrance. It's a long gravel driveway. There's dogs barking. There's guns going off. Might as well have been downtown Baghdad as far as Will was concerned. I jump out of the car and I just start screaming, please don't kill me, please don't kill me. Just to freak him out an extra bit more as well. Uh, I run in, I join my friends. They're sitting in a big circle in a room like this. It's high fives all round. 
This is the best present we have ever given ourselves. <laughs> but there's no sign of Will for about five minutes because he'd lost the use of his legs. And uh, he had to be carried in in a pretty demeaning manner. One cop's just holding his feet. The other one's hooked him under the arm. Will's making this kind of <laughs> noise. For that moment, I did feel sorry for him. Then I just thought, well, he shouldn't have proposed. And, uh, <laughs> They plonk him in this seat in the middle. We all just sit there staring at him quietly. And then he comes out with this gem. I don't know where he came up with it, but he just comes out with this. He's like... Hello. <laughs> My name is William. <laughs> I am an Irish citizen. <laughs> I demand a phone call. So I, as his best friend, I take out my phone and I start filming that break. Because uh, <laughs> next thing you know, this stripper walks in and she's dressed as a cop because we were keeping her classy. And, uh, he can hear her and he's just like this. Hello, my name is William, I hear you. I am an Irish citizen, I demand a phone call. The stripper then produces this sort of Fifty Shades of Grey style sex whip thing and gets closer and closer to him and lets it sort of brush off his ear and his shoulder and he's making this kind of uh, uh, sort of movement. And then all of a sudden she starts beating the living piss out of him with him. Just letting her, oh God, no, please, Jesus, no, please, I have a family, I have a family, which was technically true. His brothers were there laughing at him. Uh, <laughs> She keeps beating him, like, oh God, please, oh my God. At this point, I turn to one of the cops. I'm like, lads, this is fucking brilliant. But uh, this shit must go wrong. And the cop just looks at me and goes, all the time. <laughs> I'm like, really? He goes, yes, 50% of men shit themselves. I was like, 50%? Fucking fingers crossed. Let's make him shit himself. Go, go, go. She, she keeps beating him. He's like, oh, I'm a diabetic. He's not diabetic. Tony just tried that shit. Didn't work. <laughs> Didn't work either. Eventually, she pulls off the mask. And we all jump up and go, fucking yes! <laughs> The best 400 quid I have ever spent. <laughs> and uh, well, once we got him a new pair of trousers, he was fine. Uh, he, he did make me promise never to tell another living soul that story. So please keep that to yourselves. Um, I, I did get chatting to the coppers afterwards. They were, they were great guys. Turns out they were actual policemen who were moonlighting as actors. Uh, they said they made more money on a fake arrest than they do in a month of real arrests. So they're gonna keep doing it. But it is an actual service. So I was chatting them for a while and I was like, what's the worst thing genuinely that's ever happened? And he said, oh, too many to mention. And I remembered when I was signing up for the thing, there was literally skulls and crossbones on the insurance form. I plugged that under Will's nose and I just signed that for the minibus. And he went, oh, like I literally signed this. <laughs> but I, I said, look, seriously, give me an example. Just give me something that happened recently. And he goes, okay, we had a group in from Manchester a few weeks ago. And I thought, fuck, that's pretty bad. <laughs> now apparently he had a group in 12 guys from Manchester now what we had done when we did our little thing we, we'd done we, we'd gone with a fake ID mixed identity story but most people go with the drug story whereby the best man plants a bag of fake drugs on the stag hilarious crack this group from Manchester, 12 of them, the best man had planted the bag of fake drugs in the stag the cops get on the bus, they search the stag they find the drugs, they drag him off kicking and screaming Hilarity ensued, it went off without a hitch, except for one hitch. The best man had failed to tell anyone this was about to happen. This was day one of a four day bender. Every man on that bus had four days worth of drugs on them at the time. So in an attempt to not get caught, proceeded to eat all of their drugs at exactly the same time. All 12 of them ended up in the emergency room. <laughs> And the father of the bride had a fucking heart attack. That is how you do a stag party. Oh. <laughs> so, when you're, uh, you're organising a show like this, you know, you have to do a bit of research and stuff. And uh, I knew that I had this demo. Oh, sorry. Um, I had this demo um, from years ago. Uh, but the problem was the demo came on a cassette tape. Here's another picture of it. If you look carefully, you can, see my, you can see my brain through my fucking nostril. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's me singing there. Now, I made this demo, sent it to myself, and the reason I did it, like I said, was to copyright it. And my plan for the show was basically to play songs and to talk about the songs. But unfortunately, the demo didn't survive the almost 20 years in an envelope under my wardrobe. Yes, I'm terribly fucking sorry, okay? Uh, no, I, I really am. Uh, and I was really panicking before the show. I was trying to find a, a copy of the demo. Like, no one had, it's literally disappeared off the face of the earth everywhere. I was back in Dublin for a while. I went to, to friends' houses, called into their parents' houses, like going through their old computers, trying to find something. I found a lot, but I didn't find anything to do with the, <laughs> didn't find anything to do with the band, unfortunately. So there was literally no demo, and I thought, well, I have no show now. So one of my friends, I put out a thing on Facebook, one of my friends got in touch with me saying, oh, you're doing a show about the band. 
I'd love to come and see it. And I said, yeah, but the fucking demo, can't find it, you know. And he goes, right, well, are you going to show them the music video? And I went, hang on. <laughs> <laughs> There's a music video. And he went, yeah, remember we made a music, there is a fucking music video, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> we made a music video, which I am prepared to show you if you'd like. Yeah! <laughs> few things, few things about this video. First of all, I cannot be on the stage while this is playing because it's so... <laughs> A few things you need to look out for. Now, it's only about three minutes long, so don't worry about it. It's, your mind might be blown about how good it is. Or, uh, <laughs> a few things to look out for. Now, this video wasn't directed by me. It was directed by my friend Eamon, who now works in the film industry as a producer. He's not a talented director, as you'll find out. <laughs> it came out around the time of the Smashing Pumpkins 1979 uh, music video, so we decided to directly rip that off uh, and film ourselves at the worst house party of all time. Uh, it's us at a house party, jamming. A few things to look out for. No one is having any fun whatsoever. Uh, no one is smiling. Uh, none of us have the confidence to look at the camera as well. So at one point when the camera looks at me or looks at Will, he literally looks away really quickly. <laughs> uh, it's also a magical party. There's a girl trying to get into the party, but she can't because she's not, you know, she doesn't know why. And eventually, by the end of the video, she dresses in less clothes and then gets in. It's a great, it's a great message for the Me Too movement. <laughs> There's a dog walking around for no reason. Um, look out for the dog. Uh, also, um, just try and enjoy the video. I, I promise you won't last long. <laughs> but if you really want to see it, you're welcome to see it. This is the video. This is the video. And the song I'm going to show you in the video is for the song that you heard the lyrics for just a moment ago, Just 17. Please put your hands together for Just 
better than your band? <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> what, 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 what's, what was your band called, by the way? Didn't have an MC, not even arsed. Uh, <laughs> we needed a better manager, did you just say that? Definitely. Uh, kind, okay, well, we, we were fucking 15. Uh, <laughs> no, but we're, like, we were hoping maybe to get you twos, but it didn't really work out. Uh, in the end. The riff wasn't. That was good. Thanks. Uh, that wasn't me doing the lead, that was Will. He was more talented than I was. I was basically, I was the driving force behind If. Uh, and as you can see, now, do you think we were right to stop where we did? Yes. No. 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 Well, you just don't like competition, that's your problem. <laughs> well, if there's any lesson to be learned from this show, it's that, uh, there, well, there's nothing wrong with being in a band as a teenager. You never know in the future. You could get to 20 years down the line, play your amazing music to a crowd in London uh, who I'm very <laughs> delighted uh, turned up. So listen, that is the end of the show. Uh, on a uh, if, you're on a, <laughs> if you're on Twitter, give me a like, give a follow. Thank you all so much for coming, really. And uh, very quickly, uh, this show was, uh, for those who bought tickets, thank you. For those who didn't, this show was free to enter. It's not free to fucking leave. Uh, I think it's worth a tenner a head. 20, thank you. Uh, if you don't have a tenner, just the price of a pint in central London. So tenner a head would be great. Uh, you've been amazing. Have a great night. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.